In today's world, massive machines race across vast fields, moving tons of crops with incredible speed. But what if I told you that once upon a time, harvests were at risk of being lost forever? In 1843, the government had to call in the army for help as farmers desperately waited for an invention that would change everything. Let's dive into the story of how modern-day harvesting became the technological marvel it is today, and the moment in history when it almost all fell apart. But in the early days, it was a scene little changed since biblical times. Main tools were the reaping hook and its big brother the scythe. The scythe was often fitted with a cradle to a handle, which, with every stroke, would catch the cut crop. The operator would then drop it at the end of each blow. This would fall into a windrow, ready to be collected and bound into a sheaf for transport to the threshing floor. The grain would be thrashed from the straw by beating it with sticks or walking animals over it. Then it was separated by tossing the crop into the air, using shovels or large shallow dishes. The wind would carry the lighter straw and chaff away, with the heavier grain falling to the ground next to the operator, or into the dish. This method was slow and labour-intensive. It was fortunate for the operators that there was plenty of cheap convict labour to make the process practical. The first recorded attempt to mechanise harvesting came from the Roman writer Pliny. He describes the Gauls of France in the first century AD, which used a cart pushed by oxen, with a comb front that guided the heads of the crop towards the cart. A man would walk alongside and beat the crop heads with a stick, so the grain would fall into the cart, which, when full, was conveyed to the threshing floor. With the Industrial Revolution came the search for a machine to replace the army of men reaping in the fields. In 1780, the London English Society offered a gold medal to invent a reaping machine. Many ideas were put forward, and in time each would improve on the last. In 1799, James Boyce painted the revolving knife with guards. Reverend Patrick Bell of Carmilly, Scotland, put together a machine that was pushed through the crop by horses. A rotating wheel pressed the standing crop onto a knife, cutting the crop, which then fell onto a revolving apron. It carried the crop to the side and dropped it in a row to be picked up and bundled into sheaves. In America, Cyrus Hall McCormick made a machine that was much the same as Reverend Bell's, but an attendant walked alongside the machine, raking the cut crop by hand to the side. It could swathe nine foot wide and cover six acres in an afternoon, an area equal to six men with sire, 24 with reaping hooks. Although it was a workable machine, he was unable to sell it until 1842. Two years later, 86 machines were sold. In the colony of South Australia, the settlers found the Mediterranean climate ideal for wheat growing. The crop would ripen evenly, unlike in most parts of Europe or America, where the crop was often cut and stooped like hay to ripen evenly before it could be thrashed. Six years after the colony was founded, 11,000 acres was under crop. By 1842, that had grown to 23,000 acres. South Australia was a free colony. No convicts were transported to its shores. So when harvest time came, labour was so scarce that the army was called in. Most businesses in Adelaide would close their doors so that harvest could be brought in before it was lost to the elements of nature. The governor even requested the help of soldiers from other colonies. An advertisement in the South Australian Register called for a machine to harvest the wheat crop. 17 entries were received. A test in October 1843 was a failure. But a few weeks later, a different design of the same basic bull principle built by implement maker John Stokes Bagshaw for flour miller John Ridley was more than successful. The machine pushed by two horses and attended by two men harvested 70 acres in just seven days. There are many stories about how the basic principle of the Ridley Stripper came about. Mrs. Ridley claims that when she was in the field one day, she dropped a comb, and when her husband bent down to pick it up, catching a head of wheat. Ridley himself said the idea came from writings of Pliny and Palladium, their description of the machine of the Gauls. 
In typical farmer style, he ran his fingers through the crop, then with his other hand in a sweeping blow across the first, struck the wheat heads caught by his fingers, resulting in grains of wheat being dislodged from the head. Thus a simple cart with a comb on the front guiding the standing crop towards the cart became the concept displayed in Bull's model that Ridley made into a working machine. It was, as described by Pliny, but with an enclosed paddle wheel beating the ripened wheat heads, stripping the grain from them into the cart's rear. This became the Australian header, and its process of stripping has since remained part of the Australian vernacular when describing harvesting. Ridley never patented his machine, and many other implement makers from South Australia copied it, adding small variations. People like the Shearer Brothers of Manham, Bagshaws and Miller made the colony the leading wheat producer in Australia. The stripper is said to have reduced the cost of the South Australian 1843 harvest from two pounds an acre to five and six, or five dollars per hectare to one dollar forty. Mellors built a stripper so light to pull it could be propelled by a man on a bicycle. Ridley's machine, when its box was full, was taken to a spot on the field to be emptied onto a tarpaulin. Then the contents, grain and chaff, were fed into a winnower, a machine worked by hand to separate the grain from the chaff. They were usually hand-cranked machines with a fan to produce wind and riddles or a flat screen that caught the wind from the fan as the thrashed grain passed over them, allowing the lighter chaff to be separated from the grain. The first winnower were built in Australia by South Australian John Stokes Bagshaw in 1838. It took two men taking turns to shovel the chaff and grain from the stripper into a winnower and power the machine to keep up to one stripper. This was a slow energy sapping job under the hot sun. To resolve this problem and still to have a readily mobile machine, some used a horse on a treadmill to power it, such as the Eclipse treadmill. Ridley's stripper meant that farmers could increase the area of cropping, and as the area grew, labour shortages again appeared. The lifting of export tariffs by England into South Australia becoming the leading wheat producing colony and the centre of mechanised technology for many decades. In Victoria, a young man called Hugh Victor Mackay convinced his father and brother to attempt what many had tried before. So as not to interfere with the workings on the farm, Hugh's father instructed Hugh and his brother, John, to build a new smithy next to the farm's current blacksmith shop. From a suitable patch of timber on the farm, they cut the required timber and bark sheeting for the roof. With the workshop constructed, they began to build a machine from scraps they could salvage from the farm or fashion themselves. It was in 1883. By the following February, the McKays demonstrated their machine to an assembled crowd. For the first time in Australia, or anywhere in the world, a standing crop was stripped, threshed and cleaned, ready to be bagged in one operation by one man. H.V. McKay would become probably Australia's greatest ever industrialist, building all forms of farm implements and requirements at his sunshine factory. Machines were even exported to South America. At the same time in America, the binder and the windrower were finally combined to form a machine that cut the standing crop rather than beat the crop's head off the stalks. It fed the crop, straw and all to the thresher then using straw walks separated the long straw from the grain and chaff which disposed of it out the back of the machine. The grain and chaff were separated in the usual manner. The only drawback to these machines was their huge size and unwieldiness, requiring a large team of horses and many men to work them. It was the first successful combined harvester as the North Americans like to call it designed by three Australian engineers working for Canadian machinery manufacturer Massey Harris. Despite some changes, the McKay No. 1 header harvester remained basically the same. A young man decided he could make something better. His first machine trialled at the end of the 1911 harvest. For the harvest that year, a conventional stripper harvester was trialled against the new machine but could not get within a half a bag per acre. Feeling encouraged and having knocked back many overseas offers, 
its young inventor broke direct to the man himself, H.V. McKay. They went down to the paddock together. The young man did a round and legend walked alongside, then behind, inspecting everything and after some negotiations, bought the rights to the machine on the 4th of March 1916. Headley Shippard Taylor was the young man who invented the HST header harvester, yet despite this validation of the HST, more designs of strippers still came forward. McKay had produced engine function machines, useful in wet conditions where ground drive could not grip the ground properly. In 1924, Headley Shippard Taylor put together an HST in a T-shaped platform with a 12-foot comb feeding from both ends to the centre. Powered by a Ford engine, it became the world's first commercially successful self-propelled harvester. Despite all its excellence in innovation, the idea of a self-propelled header was not as popular amongst Australian farmers as it was in North America. Australian farmers preferred not to outlay the expense of an extra engine to be used only for a few weeks a year. And by 1947, production of the auto ceased. Following the buyout of HV McKay by Massey Harris came a series of interim machines, like the 506 and 507 and the reintroduction of an Australian-built self-propelled header. This marked the real beginnings of bulk handling with various factory conversions along with homemade solutions. The use of the trailing bins was popular among farmers, such as those made by Parks Industries of Parks New South Wales, who also made bulk bins for trucks and augers. The 585 was also the beginning of more robust designs, built to be pulled by tractors of growing power, like Shearer's CS105 and International's A81 and A84, all with their distinctive Australian closed fronts. American imports such as the Case 1030 with open fronts showing their Reaper thrashing heritage slowly became more common as the push for bigger and increased capacity machines grew. This led to the demise of the Australian PTO header pulled by a tractor and local manufacturer despite various improvements and the release of self-propelled models which were usually an adaption of the PTO design. Finally, the push for an even bigger machine saw the HST type reach its design limits in terms of practical size. By the late 1970s, a new concept called rotary from America and Europe started to replace all harvesters. Imported rotary threshing machines have such a massive capacity compared to the HST type, produced in large numbers enabling very competitive prices. Sadly, the days of locally designed or manufactured machines are long gone. The G-Well bag loader and other similar bag loading devices and the changeover to bulk grain handling